Thank you for listening to Mailbox Money, your guided tour through safe, sacred, and speculative investing with a plan and a purpose to do more good with newfound peace of mind. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Mailbox Money. I'm Jackson Wood, joined, as always, by my partner and my friend, Ryan Kruger. Uh, in this week's episode, this comes from, and I feel like I'm always telling stories about my kids, and maybe it's because they're just so young that they require a ton of attention, but I, I learn a lot through playing with them. And so, of course, I connected dots to investing as I was playing with my kids. And so the title of this episode is Where to Hide. And it comes from um, playing with my kids, right? We were playing hide and seek. And I think I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but we, we moved into a different house about three weeks ago, moved into a different house. And my kids quickly realized after we moved in that a new house means new hiding places for hide and seek. And I think in our old house, they had burned through all of the hiding places, all of the good spots. So they knew where to look for me every time. And my kids don't like to hide. They just like to be the hunters, you know, the, 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 the lookers or the finders. And so our games are a little skewed where they are always counting and I'm always the one hiding. So last week we're playing hide and seek. We're in the new house, new places to hide. So we start the game and I, I, they both like to count together and hide together. So the odds are always stacked against me. We've got, you know, two people searching for big dad. Uh, so I said, all right, kids, go in your room or in the room. It's actually in my room and count to 20 and uh, I'll hide. So in round one, they go into the room, they count to 20. I run into the pantry, close the door. I'm hiding in the pantry, turn the light off. They come out, we're done counting. They search around the house. Eventually they find me sitting in the pantry, right? So they laugh. It's a lot of fun. Next time, next round, I say, all right, go count this time. Let's count to 30 so dad can find a different hiding spot. And uh, when you're done, come out. So round two, they go count. I hide. This time I hid in the coat closet by the front door. It's a small closet, so I had to you know, smash my way in there. But I'm thinking I'm going to be behind some coats, which we're still wearing, unfortunately, in May, June. It's cold here. They come out. First thing they do is they go to the pantry. I'm not in the pantry. That's where they found me last time. So then they wander around the house. Eventually they find me in the coat closet and they laugh. We have fun. I scare him as I jump out. So now we're on to round three, go into the room, count. I hide this time, instead of in the closet, I hide under the couch and our couch has these legs on it. So you can see underneath the couch, right into the door of the room when you're laying on the floor. So they get done counting. I'm laying there trying not to laugh, thinking, what, you know, are they going to look for me in the coat closet again? And of course, right, as soon as they get done counting and open the door, they beeline it straight for the coat closet. I'm not there. I'm trying not to laugh. I see their dirty little feet running across the floor. We don't have a yard yet. So every time they come in from the house, their feet are just covered in dirt because we don't have lawn. And uh, eventually they find me laying there on the floor behind the couch. And my daughter, who is four, just falls over laughing every time she finds me and I try to scare her. And this goes on and on and on, you know, for round after round after round. And as I'm sitting there laying on the floor, watching my kids go first to the pantry, then to the coat closet, then to the, uh, uh, then behind the couch after round, I'm realizing that they're expressing a behavioral tendency called recency bias, right? And maybe this is just the way that my brain works, but they would look for me that after in the same place that they found me the previous round, right? So first it was the pantry, then the closet and behind the couch. And what I realized as I was laying there on the ground, dusty wood floor from the backyard is that not only do I see this recency bias in my kids when we're playing hide and seek, and I give them a little credit because they're still young little kids, but we also see this all the time in markets, investing, in portfolio management, and specifically in asset allocation, right? Recency bias is this phenomenon that makes investors flock into asset classes after they have experienced incredible rallies and incredible runs, right? So think of cryptocurrencies in 2020, or like Ryan mentioned in last week's episode, 
perhaps it's tech after quarter one, right? Outrageously good returns. It also makes investors flee from asset classes that have done poorly over time. So think about selling stocks after 2022 or even bonds after 2022. And so this recency bias is um, expressed not only in this simple game of hide and seek, but in investing, right? And it's one of these things that we need to think very carefully about because it can impact our ultimate performance and how the, the ultimate outcome that we experience as investors. So one of my favorite images that I get to see every year is what's called an asset tapestry. McKay is going to put this on the screen for us. Um, if, if you're listening to this, it looks like a quilt. And it reminds me of the quilt that my mom would make for me for a Christmas present each year. But it's the different asset classes and their relative performance compared to each other in a given year. So you can go back as far as you want, but they're squares per asset class and it shows their performance. And if you, you know, it's a really simple um, chart to understand image. It's not really a chart, it's an image. Um, but when you look at it and you, you spend maybe two or three minutes staring at this, there's different colors for different, different asset classes. And it's very rare that the asset class that performed that was the top performing asset class one year is the top performing asset class the next year. And it's even more rare that it happens year after year after year. So you can see that the, return, the total return of these asset classes differs dramatically one year to the next. And so when you look at this, and where my mind is going is I'm watching my little kid's feet run across the floor looking for me, is I'm thinking about the gurus on TV or on podcasts that will say things like, you know what, due to inflation this year and what we've seen with the CPI prints and, and the inflation rate, gold looks like a really good safe haven for us to put money in. Or they'll say things like, cash is king this year. Or my favorite, which I laugh every single time I read this, is that people will say a lot, buy bonds and then wear diamonds, right? Implying if you buy bonds right now, you're going to make a bunch of money and be able to buy diamonds. Um, and so I ask myself, are these gurus looking into a crystal ball that none of us have? Or are they searching for the coat closet because that's where we found dad last time, right? Or are we searching the pantry because that's where we found dad last time? And so the, the title of the podcast, Where to Hide or Hide and Seek, um, what should we do as investors when we experience these difficult patches in the markets, right? And so my advice and our advice on this is going to sound a little different and a little bit interesting, but I believe that you should hide your money in a story, right? So that's not me claiming an asset class or claiming what return or looking into a crystal ball. I think you should hide your money in a story. And so what is your story, right? I came up with two questions to ask yourself to answer the question of what your story is. And then we're going to get into some nerdy math here and, and go through this. But the first question I would ask yourself as an investor, and you're thinking about your money and where to hide it, is what are you investing for, right? And this is a really simple question, but the answers can be really profound. So for many of you, like Ryan and I, we're investing for our financial freedom, our freedom day right? The, the, the time period in the future when the income from our portfolio is greater than our expenses, which we define as your needs and your wants, right? So that moment of financial freedom, your freedom day, that is the key driver in many of our uh, portfolios, the, the, many of our financial plans. And the second question is, what do you want your life to look like in the future, right? What type of lifestyle do you want to live? When you know the type of life that you want to live, you can start backing into what that costs, right? And that will give you some math and some direction to focus on. And now we can start building your story and we can start building a plan for where to hide your money. And it comes as no surprise to anybody that has listened to this. And, and our new favorite basketball coach told me yesterday that he's listened to over half our episodes as he found the show. Um, we believe in the story of growing dividends and we believe that growth of income is a phenomenal place to hide your money because it can answer those questions and you don't have to be searching for the next performing asset class so as funny as it sounds we believe that you should hide your money in a story i'm just thinking about and, and hide and seek it does seem to be an ageless game my kids still like it but we're when you're playing hide and seek hide behind the couch, we were playing risk, which I found equally as funny. Um, 
you know, game based on world domination played by some folks that can't even fold their socks or finish their dishes. Um, so all of these different game boards and that tapestry that you share is in every single brokerage firm and advisors office. They share it. it it's an incredible conversation starter. And I would just submit as I'm listening to you pull together that comparison, I think we can all appreciate. I would suggest don't forget what business those gurus or predictors are in to be the most aggressive when right or the most conservative when things are bad. And there is a reason that I don't know any of them, not a single macro forecaster um, that is independently wealthy. <laughs> um, just keep that in mind on the guessing game between which one of those color boxes is going to be the Cause that's where 90% of the conversations and articles and they're all, like you said, they're all centered around whatever their version of a prediction would be. And I would say, um, as you're describing for whatever operating system, someone is not just believing in, but that story has got to be based on evidence and nonfiction and math in our opinion, because that's time tested and battle tested. What I learned lasts a lot longer than that guessing game and all those different squares or being allocated and owning all of them, which some people throw up their hands more than ever. When I started this business 27 years ago, more than ever, most advisors are just saying, own them all. I, I, I'm, I'm acknowledging that I can't guess which one of those boxes. I would just say what has outlasted both of those approaches, guessing which square or just owning them all is a repeatable operating system. Um, Dividends absolutely represent that in the stock market. And there's a lot of different ways to measure different kinds of investments and then dividend growth for certain. That's an operating system that you can not only believe in um, and that will stand the test of time, but that math and evidence, it's a never ending series of exploration and research to go find using that operating system to go on those treasure hunts, to go seek and when you said, I thought you said below the couch before, and I was like, man, what kind of couch do you have up there in Idaho? I can't barely fit my hand under my couch and I don't know, I don't know what's all going on under there. So when you said behind the couch, it, it, it made a little bit more sense. Um, and I've also never sat in the pantry. So you must be pretty good. You had a long time to wait in the pantry. I'm, I'm, I'm in and out of there. I'm, I'm, I got five, five kids trying to win me. It's, it's last man to one of those boxes in the pantry. So it's real quick. You got to stick and move. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Yeah, I went to the pantry first because I thought it's going to take them a while to find me. At least there'll be some snacks in here, right? As I can sit here and wait for them. Um, and our new house actually has a pantry. Last time we just had cupboards. So we've got a whole new opportunity set for dad as I'm hiding. Yeah, and you know, I think what I wanted to do was kind of come up with, when you look at this asset tapestry, it goes back, you know, 15 or 20 years, depending on which image you're looking at. And, you know, you can point out different times during the last decade where things have gotten tough, right? And so when things get tough or difficult or confusing, all the gurus come out and they'll say, go do this or go do that. And so you as the investor are sitting there thinking, all right, do I run to cash? Uh, do I run to gold? Uh, do I run to Bitcoin? Right. A lot of big people said for years that Bitcoin was an inflation hedge. And the first time we saw inflation in the history of Bitcoin's existence, it went from $70,000 down to 15000 Right. And so do you run to these different asset classes or do you run to a story that has math backing it up? So what I wanted to do is look at the actual moving parts inside of a dividend growth strategy over the last three, five and 10 year periods. And I pulled these numbers. This is pure math, just like you said. The story needs to be based off of evidence and numbers and data, not just good feelings and not just something that creates peace of mind. But I also wanted to paint the picture of some things that have happened over the last 10 years that indicate that times were potentially tough. So the first one is in 2008. Obviously, it's the great financial crisis. Uh, 2010 through 2012 was the European debt crisis, right? So negative event, negative event. 2013 
through present time, the rise of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. A lot of people were flocking into this new emerging asset class. 2018 through 20 was difficult because we had the US-China trade war. And then obviously in 2020 through whenever was the pandemic and all of the issues that we all struggled through in that period of time. Right, so over the last 10 years, there have been some really difficult, uh, difficult situations and tough times. There have also been some incredibly um, FOMO-inducing good things that have happened, right? With crypto and with a lot of the tech and a lot of these other companies, right? And, and positions. So were you looking to hide? Were you looking to jump into something during any of these periods? I'm almost certain if you're listening to our investing podcast, you've heard people talk about what to do when these things come up. But instead, if you've been hiding your money in a story, here's the math that you have been enjoying along the way. So what I did was I looked at a dividend growth strategy, which is ours, in-house dividend growth strategy. And I looked at the dividend growth rate annualized from a three-year, a five-year, and a 10-year period. Uh, the three-year dividend, uh, annualized dividend growth rate of our portfolio that we manage is 18.1%. Yeah, pretty good. We're really pleased with that. The five-year, 17% even. And then the 10-year is 15.3%. So to put that into... Uh, terms for portfolio manager or for uh, investor and the holder of a portfolio, the, the individual holdings that you had as uh, in a dividend growth strategy over this 10 year period of time, the average increase in your annual income over 10 year period of time is 15.3%. So think of that an average dividend growth rate of 15.3% during the last 10 years, which included things like the great recession, the pandemic, the debt crisis, the exciting component of crypto. I mean, it's not only fear that's driving this, but it's overexcitement and some irrational behavior in terms of going into asset classes. And so what I wanted to do was just create this as an example of how a story will work, as long as it's backed by math and by numbers and by data, during a difficult period in the market. And it's been a difficult 10 years. If you look at this, the seriousness of the events I listed, um, it just seems like every couple of years, something you know wild is happening in the markets. Yet a 15.3 annualized dividend growth rate over that same period. When you compare that to something like the dividend aristocrats or an equally weighted S&P 500 portfolio, um, the dividend growth strategy looks even better, right? So what I wanted to do was create some math and put this into perspective as for, uh, for those of you that implement a dividend growth strategy in your financial plan. So assuming a 2% starting yield 10 years ago, which I think is relatively conservative, but we don't, you know, we don't want to be cherry picking or accused of any of that. 2% starting yield on your initial investment portfolio. And if that yield is growing, by an average of 15.3%, at the end of the 10 years, you have over a 7% yield on cost. So that means that that same in investment, instead of paying you 2%, is now paying 7.2%, right? And so think about that stability and that um, relentless just increase in income that you've experienced while the entire world is worried about what to jump into, what to jump out of, how to rebalance, how to shift, how to be tactical, how to implement momentum. In my mind, just the simple story of dividend growth is incredibly powerful. You don't have to go through this process of fighting recency bias or worrying about asset classes. I, I just thought that that math, although it's simple, is incredibly profound. And it's incredibly important to remind ourselves of that when things get tough and when things get difficult. I am reminded as you say that it was, I think it was Leonardo da Vinci who said the ultimate sophistication is simplicity. And when I started my investing career, I wouldn't have believed how much that applies to this industry as much or more so than any other. And I think of that because you would need a back of an envelope and a pencil to do that math. And that's assuming zero help from the stock market. So what if the stock market does this or that? All of those predictions, you don't even need them to do that simple math. If the market went nowhere for that entire 10 year period, if you've never heard of what we call mailbox math affectionately, 
that yield on cost that Jackson just went through, that assumes zero appreciation or compounding from a market that is working. Um, I've told people anytime they hire us, if they ever once hear me hang, say hang in there because the market always goes up, that we are to be fired. That's never happened. And it's just a simpler story to your point, Jackson, to believe in that. And if the market happens to go up over a year or 10 or 15 year period, all gravy, all surprise to the upside. But if you can work around that simple operating system, and if in your example, if 7% might be enough to live on, given a certain nest egg, it at least makes this more real. Here's what I need to save. Here's what I need to work towards. Here's how much is enough, honey, because we've got it and we can make, or we just need to keep working longer and saving more. I like that math versus relying on predictions because I think, and I've seen, that's where our dysfunctional relationships with the market begins. That a lot of folks really secretly don't like working and they want the market to work out for them even faster so they can retire. That's where we get all this anxiety. I, I think I've seen um, very, very different relationship with the stock market if you choose not to expect anything and you trade all of those expectations for simpler appreciation, good lifestyle too, trade. Um, those upside surprises tend to work out a lot better than predictions. You know, I was on a, earlier this week, I was giving a presentation to advisors and I, I'm not picking on anybody here, but there was another advisor on the panel with me and they were talking about distribution of assets you know, once they've reached the freedom day or their retirement date, they call it retirement. They're not on our team. And they said that they've got it positioned where if their growth account is what they were saying, if their growth account is working, they'll make distributions from that. If the growth account isn't working, they have a conservative bucket that they'll use to make distributions from. And in my mind, I started thinking like mathematically trying to back into how much would you put in a growth account and what type of market environment would you need for that to work versus, and when would you even know it's working versus when would you decide to pull from a conservative bucket because the growth isn't right? And I just started coming up with all these, these questions and scenarios in my mind. And, and instead, it made me feel grateful for our approach of the math I went through assumes no market appreciation at all. We're simply looking at the income from the portfolio. And so when you look at a one page plan created by Freedom Day, there is no assumption of market growth anywhere in the plan. All we're looking at is the dividend growth. And the dividend growth rate is much more stable and much more predictable than the total market return of any given market. And you can see evidence of that by simply looking at that asset tapestry. And if anybody out there wants this, um, you know, wants this image, let me know and I'll email it to you. It's fascinating. You only get one every year, right? Because you have to wait till the end of the year for the asset classes to calculate their total return. But it's just mind blowing. These, these tiles never line up. There is absolutely no sort of pattern that you can come up with when you look at these because the returns are so random every single year. And the number one stat that, that Ryan actually taught me and, and gave me like a quiz via text message a couple of years ago is, Here's the total, or here's the average return of the S&P 500 over the last 100 years. And it was whatever number, 10 point something, right? And he said to me, guess how many times in those 100 years, the S&P has had a return within 1% plus or minus of that average annual return. And I thought about it and I, I didn't really know what to answer. And finally, I got the answer from Ryan and he said, it's one time. It's what happened one time in the last 100 years. It's either usually 5% or 10% higher than the average or 5 or 10% lower. And so when you think about the story of dividend growth and how this relates to portfolio management and your freedom day, think of the stability that that introduces into a portfolio. And I hope I'm not making this overly simplistic, but that is so powerful in my mind. And I just want to echo that it answers those two questions, right? What you're saving for, how you're going to get there, and do you have enough money? And you can look at the math with no assumptions baked into it and know if you're on track or off track. And when you're on track and you're there, you feel incredibly comfortable knowing that you haven't used assumptions or, you know, fingers crossed guesses that you're actually, you've actually made it. And that's powerful. There's been a few studies showing those 
annual predictions of where the market will land and how consistently this big giant scatter plot of how your best bet if you were going and by the way if that's happens i think we should have a mailbox money show game if anybody can that ask you for one of those if they could order one through ten and correctly guess the finishing how those horses finish this year um what kind of prize would would we give them jackson i mean what would they get what do you think? Because I think that odds of that, like Buffett does a million dollar or was it a million dollars for the perfect bracket? Um, I think you could probably stake that kind of same risk. You'd have to get that reinsured. We'll have to learn that by <laughs> Elliot, our current, currently our number one portfolio manager. Um, but the gurus and their predictions, you're actually better off guessing where they have, if you had, if you were in the guessing business and we're not where the biggest open spot was, where none of the guesses were in a given year, it's going to be slower. It's going to be higher. Because if you really think about this second order of the business of gurus, the for-profit business of being outlandish, they're really not telling you where they think objectively the market is as much as they are reflecting where they are already invested. Let, let's face it. I think it was... Um, I don't know how to pronounce the name, Anais Nin, who said, um, people don't see things as they are. They see things as we are. And it's more hope or sharing. If you are bullish, if you are fully invested in U.S. equities and you're not diversified and you don't own, a lot of your predictions and, <laughs> and recommendations are going to reflect that out of self-interest. Um, if instead you have an open playbook and an operating system that remains curious at all times. I, I said this last, I love not knowing what's going to happen next and letting this objective selection system. That's why I said earlier, it doesn't have to be ours. It can be your own as long as it's built with quantitative evidence, the repeatable system of what will happen next, because it specifically as your image this week details, it's a very, very good bet that it will be very different than what it was before. So letting yourself and respecting being in their strength, there's weakness. We talked about technical analysis last week. I, I love not knowing. I love not making a prediction. I love not being convinced. Um, and it works out pretty well. All right. So round four, hide and seek. Okay. I went pantry, coat closet behind the couch kids go back count to 20 round four i go behind the couch exact same place i hid in round three okay so i'm thinking of an asset tapestry and maybe there's a square that has the same position one year after the next maybe maybe there's one of them in about you know 200 different squares my kids count they come out first thing they do upstairs into my daughter's room to look for me they find me behind the couch. My daughter, four years old, fell on the floor laughing hysterically. And she said, dad, you were in the same place as you were last time. And I just, I couldn't get it out of my mind about how investors are trapped in this same, same situation, right? And it's something that, that luckily, if you understand, you hide in the story, you can hide your money, put your money in dividend growth, and answer the questions. It requires zero pivots. It requires zero crystal balls. It allows you to just focus on playing hide and seek. And instead of thinking about portfolios while you're playing hide and seek, you can just focus on the kids and have fun and play hide and seek or whatever it is in the stage of life that you're in. You can focus on that and you don't have to be worried about, did you allocate correctly? Or did you follow the right person? Because you don't have to do any of that. And it's pointless to play that game anyways when you've got something with math and data that can back your story up. So Amen. <laughs> hope everybody liked it. Um, one of my favorite things that we have been doing a lot of recently are speaking with people that have been listening to the podcast, helping them create financial plans, build their portfolios. If anybody listening or watching this would like to schedule a meeting with our team, you can reach out to us team at freedomdaysolutions.com can get in contact with us through our website, which is freedomdaysolutions.com. And with that, we will see everybody next week.
This show is brought to you by Freedom Day Solutions, LLC, a registered investment advisory firm advising individuals and families nationwide. Performance is not guaranteed and past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. To learn more, visit freedomdaysolutions.com. This show contains general information that is not suitable for everyone and was shared for informational purposes only. Any forward-looking statement or opinion expressed is subject to change without notice. Nothing contained herein constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice, nor is it to be relied on in making investment or other decisions. Clients of Freedom Day Solutions may hold positions in the securities discussed.